Thanks to Raycon for sponsoring today's video. What happens when a planet melts? For Mercury, the closest planet to our Sun, this is no idle question. At the risk of it being understated, Mercury is a very hot planet, with daytime temperatures reaching an incredible 430 degrees Celsius, the temperature of some wood-burning fires, the rocks and dust on Mercury's surface bake beneath a blistering heat that pushes them towards their limits. It's not the hottest planet in the solar system, that honor goes to Venus thanks to its thick atmosphere, but it's certainly up there. The Mercury we know today has actually cooled considerably over the years. There is ice at its polar caps, and in our last video we discussed the signs on its surface that show it has contracted over time as its interior became colder. So what was it like back then? I'm Alex McColgan and you're watching Astrum. Join with me today on a trip back through time to an age billions of years ago when the rocks on Mercury were not just approaching a melting point, but were frequently tipped past it. When meteors rained from the sky, and when lava flowed through canyons like rivers. When the soil burst and bubbled in volcanic eruptions that carved out massive craters in the planet's crust. To an age when the planet's surface melted. When Mercury was a lava planet. When rock is sufficiently heated, its solid structure breaks down and it turns into the gloopy, viscous liquid known as magma, with a viscosity, or runniness, 10,000 or 100,000 more viscous than water. For a point of reference, this is similar viscosity to tomato ketchup, although I would not recommend putting this on your food. Depending on the rock type, magma forms at temperatures of at least 600 degrees Celsius but potentially as high as 1,300 degrees Celsius. So, for Mercury to have begun to melt, we know that it must have reached at least these temperatures. In spite of being much less runny than water, lava can still travel for great distances before stopping. This is because once the surface of lava hardens, it forms an insulating layer that keeps the rest of the lava within protected so it can flow freely. How do we know this happened on Mercury? The clues can be found in craters like Raditladi. Scientists estimate that Raditladi is a relatively young crater, likely under a billion years old, with well-preserved walls and a floor relatively clear of other later impacts. It's large, over 25 kilometers in diameter. Notice how rough the hills are around the crater, and yet inside is a smooth plain. This is no coincidence. Originally, the terrain inside Raditladi was likely about as rugged as the hills around it. So why is it so smooth now? The answer is lava. When lava is left on its own, it will try to form the flattest surface possible, just like water does if you put it in a bowl, as it is dragged down under the effects of gravity. The same happened here. An asteroid crashed into the planet's surface, and the crater quickly filled with lava. Once the lava cooled, it formed the smooth plain you see here. But where did this lava come from? There are two theories. The first is that the impact of the meteor triggered a creeping volcanic eruption, as magma from beneath the surface rose up through the cracks to fill the basin. The second explanation is that the surface within the crater got so hot due to the impact of the meteor that it pushed the already hot rock crust over the tipping point into melting. This kind of lava is known as impact melt. The true explanation is likely a combination of both. Now that we know that smoothness is a sign of lava flow, we suddenly realize that there are numerous other craters on Mercury that similarly must have been filled with lava. Just look at Rustavelli, where crags of mountain can be seen poking up through the smooth lava layer. Or Copland, Polygnotus, or Rachmaninov. Rachmaninov is particularly interesting, as here you can see the strong indicators of lava bubbling up through from beneath the surface to the center of the crater. Take a look at the strange, crinkled cracks forming a rough circle inside the central crater. Such craters are a signal that a slower outpouring of magma pushed up from beneath the surface, breaking the plane, 
then pushing up, and then cooling again under the effects of Mercury's fluctuating temperature. Here, and in many of these impact craters, the collisions from space trigger deep volcanic activity from within Mercury's shell. But lava didn't just flow within the craters. Let's look at the valley known as Angkor Valis. Here, you can see clear signs of smooth lava flow, but this time moving like a river. The lava travelled from high to low ground, until it eventually poured into the basin next to it. Flows like these ended up filling massive seas, taking up vast swaths of the planet, and turning them the more orangey colour we see today. Scientists have begun to recognise this telltale orange colour as a sure sign of volcanic activity, and from it, a more detailed picture has begun to emerge of conditions on early Mercury that make it even less hospitable. Areas like this one, to the northeast of Rachmaninov, are likely formed by volcanic activity. When Messenger flew over this area in 2015, it took detailed photos of it and found the surface to be covered in a fine dust. Upon review, it was obvious what this dust was. Volcanic ash that must have fired out of vents and covered the terrain around it. NASA scientists likened it to snow, fiery, hot, angry snow. So it wasn't just lava flowing beneath your feet that you'd have to contend with on Mercury, but burning ash falling from the sky. And that was just the calmer volcanoes. The final indicator of volcanic activity on Mercury hints at eruptions so destructive that whole chunks were scooped out of the planet. Take a look at this crater Navoy. This is no impact crater. When a crater is formed onto a hard surface, one that's not sufficiently hot to melt into lava, a central peak is usually formed. This is because when the crater walls suddenly find themselves exposed, gravity suddenly exerts itself on all that loose particulate, which rushes down the walls of the newly scooped out basin towards the centre. Once there, Having built up momentum, it comes crashing into all the rocks and landslide that is sliding down from the other side of the crater. The two sides meet, and all that momentum and energy forces them to keep moving in the only direction they can, up. You see the same effect more clearly when you throw a large rock into water. The water of the newly formed basin rushes in to fill the gap, but then crashes into water from the other side, and all of it shoots upward in a powerful secondary splash. But unlike water, the sand and loose rock of a crater does not level out, but forms a central peak. Depending on what angle the meteor impacted, this peak is either perfectly rounded or possibly teardrop shaped. However, the ray's central formation of Navoy is neither of these things. As scientists looked at this, they came to the conclusion left that this crater was not formed by an impact at all. Instead, it had been carved out through the force of an erupting volcano. At 66 kilometers in diameter, the amount of force exploding upwards that would have been necessary to carve out this crater and scatter its remnants for kilometers all around must have been truly massive. So there you have it. Meteors raining from the sky, tipping the rocks they landed on over the melting point. Volcanoes bursting forth either filling the landscape slowly with bubbling magma in lakes and fiery rivers, or choking the air with burning ash. Not that there was any air to begin with, beyond the thick toxic gases emitted with the eruptions. And even the ground you could stand on might at any moment explode under your feet. This is what it was like when a planet was melting. Mercury is quiet now. As near as we can tell, there are no longer any active volcanoes on the planet. Although the sun still bakes down on it, the unbridled fury that raged beneath its surface is now calm and soothed. Yet, for all those who know how to look, the evidence of what once was is still there, locked in the geological record. It's the scars that tell the story of a violent past. There's never a wrong time to think about getting your mother or female loved one a present, but for a lot of you, you might be thinking of it now more than at other times. And something you might want to consider is Raycon's new earbuds, for listening to music or podcasts, or even taking voice calls while keeping your hands free. 
I found them to be tiny yet comfortable with their optimized gel tips and the audio quality was great. And they really don't fall out, no matter how hard I shake my head about, so you don't have to worry about that. I use them while editing, but they are also good for being on the go too, as they last for 8 hours of continual use and have 32 hour additional charge time with their little docking station, so you don't always have to be plugged in. They have over 49,000 5 star reviews and yet are only half the price of other premium earbuds, so if you are looking for new earbuds, I recommend you check these out. Why not treat your mother with Raycons? And if you use my link in the description below, you will get an additional 15% off. So definitely have a look. Thanks for watching. If you missed the previous episode, catch it here. A big thanks to my patrons and members for supporting the channel. If you find value in these videos and want to support too, find the links in the description below. All the best and see you next time.